actually trying to criminalize us. Anti-protest or anti-violence, reasonable or racist. This is for the bad actors, those that are acting violent or inciting violence. The governor poised to sign one of the most controversial bills of the year. People are back in the Keys. Tourists are back in the Keys, but cruise ships are not. Senator Thurston, Vice Chair Garcia, the move is on in Tallahassee to reverse what Key West voters want. There's no good reason, none whatsoever, to wait one more day. A South Florida congressional seat empty, but for how long? The big news of the week, we have Miami-Dade, Broward, and Monroe covered this week in South Florida. Good morning, glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney. I'm Glennon Milberg. We begin a packed hour with the headline that jolted South Florida vaccination efforts this week as the CDC suspended use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. The number of people vaccinated in Florida was down sharply in the last week. What is the Biden administration going to do to bring it back up? And what about the governor? What will he do? And then the, what is the president going to do to keep guns out of the hands of the mentally ill? He promised he would take action on day one, but he has done little more than denounce the epidemic of gun violence. We have a lot to talk about with Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, Democrat from Weston. Good morning to you and Congresswoman. Before we begin, condolences on the passing of your mother a yeah. few weeks ago. Our hearts are with the Wasserman and Schultz families. We are yeah. so sorry to hear that. I met her at the airport once in Washington, a lovely woman. Yeah, blessed in memory. We, we give you our heartfelt condolences, Congresswoman. Appreciate that so much. Thank you both. Uh, let's begin here with uh, the pause and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Clearly that had a lot to do with the fact vaccinations in the state of Florida were down 35% in the last week. And the goal of getting to 80% where there is herd immunity, I mean, something has to be done. What do you think the, the governor or the Biden administration should do to get the demand for uh, vaccines back up again? Well, I think it was an important step for the CDC to take, given that you have six people who ended up with life-threatening clots that, that really needed to be reviewed. And so the pause makes a lot of sense. Um, I heard this morning from uh, Dr. Fauci during his round of interviews on morning television that they expect that by Friday that likely they will be able to lift that pause. And, you know, look, at the end of the day, they've kept on stressing that this is an extremely rare situation, but one that, that needed to be reviewed. You literally have six people out of nearly 7 million who have been vaccinated. So making sure that we can boost vaccine confidence, not deteriorate it, is really important. But I expect that it'll only be a few more days and we'll be up, back up and running with the Johnson & Johnson vaccines. You know, uh, next in this program, Congresswoman will be talking to FIU epidemiologist uh, Eileen Marty. So we'll get into the, the science of what happened with J&J. &J. Um, staying on the vaccine theme for just a, a moment, you, you wrote a letter to the governor this week, you and some others, uh, asking him to relax the requirements for undocumented uh, citizens among us and also for the seasonal workers. What kind of response has you, have you gotten for that? Because that, that's a significant number of people in South Florida who may not have access to any vaccine at the moment. Well, unsurprisingly, we haven't gotten any response from the governor because he has been grossly irresponsible in the way he has implemented anything related to this entire pandemic, uh, including vaccinations, where he has vaccinated the, the uh, prioritized wealthy white people, as opposed to making sure that we can distribute the vaccine evenly and equally. Uh, can, we, can, I, can I just say, because there is no one here to defend that, I, I just want to say that the governor categor categorically denies that yeah. and, and was focused well, yeah, on I'm seniors. Sorry, let, yeah. let me just finish what I was saying. I, <laughs> you can ask someone else uh, for their response. But as I had said, as I said, he has grossly irresponsibly handled the entire pandemic, whether it was in the beginning delaying, making sure that we could pause the circulation of people and refusing to acknowledge that we actually had community spread. People forget about that. It was so long ago, all the way to now where he has been very, very much favoring 
wealthy white communities that's consistent it's been in the process of being investigated it's been uh, it's been criticized and so now and look i agree that in the beginning we had vaccine tourism taking place here and i i know when i was volunteering at vaccine sites there were people that were online that were not from the state of florida and so we needed to make sure that we got a handle on that so the doses that come to florida were while they were very sparse got got into the arms of Floridians. But now we have so many vaccines that you don't even need an appointment. And making sure that we can vaccinate the vulnerable, making sure we can vaccinate farm workers and immigrants to this country, you know, residency is, is understandable, but there are lots of ways to identify that you reside in the state of Florida. And we've asked the governor to relax those requirements. We also sent a letter to, uh, to, to FEMA and to the uh, to, to Secretary uh, Becerra because at the Fed, at, we asked at the federal sites, at the FEMA sites, that they re relax those, and they don't have to uh, go through Governor DeSantis to do that. Mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that President Biden and the federal government will actually be responsive. I don't expect uh, Governor DeSantis to start caring about equal distribution of helping people make sure that they get vaccines in their arms. Yeah. Uh, Congresswoman, talking about sending messages, letters to the governor, you and representatives Lois Frankel, Ted Deutsch, uh, this week, as it were, sent a letter to him and said, please call a special election, set a date for an election in the 20th congressional district to replace the late Elsie Hastings. Have you heard back from him on that? No, of course not. Um, and I will tell you that uh, after my own devastating personal loss of my mom, you know, four days later, we lost Elsie Hastings, who was one of my mentors and an incredible civil rights and community and national and international leader. And his constituents in Florida's 20th district deserve a swift call for a special election so that we can make sure that they have a representative being their voice and not have a, the gaping void that the loss of Alcee Hastings leaves. We are about to uh, go through the appropriations process. We know I serve on the appropriations committee. We need to make sure that throughout that process, and also when we do the infrastructure bill, when we have further COVID relief, that the needs of his constituents are represented by someone they elect. Uh, it's been 12 days. Uh, the last time we had a special election, Rick Scott called a special election in 13 days. Uh, I, I am... Uh, hopeful and urging Governor DeSantis, as we, our delegation is, to call this election to, beginning tomorrow, no later than tomorrow. You know, in, in anticipation of this coming up, because like, like everything that we discuss, it's politics sort of is the overarching theme, but there in the past 20 years, <laughs> the special elections that needed to be called in Florida to replace either someone who had passed in office or who resigned, the average has been three to five months. Uh, do you expect that three to five months will, will be an acceptable time frame? Well, that's not how long it's taken to call the election. That's, that's part of the problem, Glenna. Uh, in fact, uh, Charlie Crist called the, the special election to replace uh, Robert Wexler within 21 days. And because our special election process has to go through a qualifying period, then a primary, then a general election, and there needs to be a period of time for each of those to occur, it already takes a pretty long time just to go through the elections process. So calling the election swiftly, scheduling it so that that whole process can unfold is essential because who wouldn't, if you represent the constituents of the state of Florida, who wouldn't want to make we, sure we have our full complement of our Congress, our 27 member strong congressional delegation leaving 800,000 people unrepresented is is irresponsible. And and also it means that we are we struggle more to bring resources home to our state. Yeah. So Governor DeSantis needs to get on the stick and call this special election this yeah. week. Yeah, very, very briefly, Congresswoman, it has been your practice over the years not to endorse in a Democratic primary. We've already seen five or six uh, politicians in both Palm Beach and Broward counties uh, who have already said they want to run for that seat. Um, are you going to kind of hold an endorsement until there is a nominee? Yes, that's my plan. Uh, I know I would be proud to work with any of the individuals that have thrown their hat into the ring. Uh, we have a lot of really well-qualified people who have expressed interest in uh, I know they would all agree that, that those are giant shoes that really aren't fillable, but we need to make sure that we 
I, I know I have to work with whoever gets elected and look forward to working with whoever gets elected, but I won't be making an endorsement in this race. Congresswoman, sit tight if you would. We'll take a quick break and be right back in two minutes. On this Sunday morning, on This Week in South Florida, Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz, we are so glad you are with us. Let me bring up a topic we have gone over in the past because Gabby Giffords was and remains your very close friend, almost killed by a deranged gunman. Here this week, obviously, in Indianapolis, yet another instance of mass shooting. So I, I just feel compelled to ask you, will Congress ever do anything serious to take guns out of the hands of people who are mentally ill uh, or those who, you know, have obvious criminal records. Well, Michael, like my dear friend Gabby, I, I remain optimistic and hopeful. We, uh, we passed the universal background check bill out of the House already. We passed the Charleston, Charleston loophole bill out of the House already. Thankfully, President Biden has taken some action through executive order, and we need the Senate to act. But Look, you, you, you do need to look at, let's look at the progress we've made. The, the NRA is essentially uh, a nearly neutered organization. They've filed bankruptcy. Their influence has waned. Organizations like Gabby's through Giffords have all across the country passed and made progress at the state level in making sure that we can keep guns out of the hands of people who should, shouldn't have them. We need to pass Jamie's Law, which I'll be reintroducing to enforce federal law that says that you need to do background checks for when you are purchasing ammunition, but we have a long way to go. I mean, 45 mass shootings, I think, in the last month, uh, every single day, there, uh, there is a mass shooting in this country, sometimes more than one, and we clearly have a lot of work to do. And we need to just keep pushing harder and be relentless, just like Gabby is. You know, among those executive actions that the president had taken, he, he recommends those red flag laws to I, be a national model. We, we have them in Florida, largely thanks to the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas Commission and and the families. Uh, but what's interesting about this, this latest mass shooting that we're all watching at the Federal Express uh, facility is that, that those laws that are in place right now should have prevented that young man from having a weapon. And yet something fell through the cracks. Mm -hmm. Well, what it looked like was that a red flag law actually confiscated a weapon that he had when his mother reported her concern about a year ago. But then, you know, if you don't stay on top of the and monitor someone who has had that mental illness and had a red flag law and acted on them, that he should have been flagged and not been able to purchase or get access to an, to an additional weapon. So the investigation, I know, is ongoing. But, uh, but he did have a weapon con confiscated, just clearly not the one that, uh, that he used to commit that horrific mass murder. Yeah. Congresswoman, let me change the focus here and let's look at immigration for a minute. It has been a concern of yours, particularly let's look at refugees. These are people who, you know, yes. have already been vetted. Thousands of them are sitting, you know, waiting to come to get a plane ticket, come to the United States. People who were translators who helped the American troops in Afghanistan or Iraq and the the president had said in the campaign he's going to open up the floodgates, let in maybe 62,000. Then this week he pulled back and said, no, we're going to keep it at 15,000 like President Trump and then changed his mind. So where does it stand and what would you like to see happen here? Well, I'm thankful that President Biden said that by May they will raise the cap and we're looking forward to that. It's important to remember that Donald Trump and, and, and Stephen Miller completely dismantled our functioning immigration system. And so rebuilding it and making sure that we can reestablish ourselves as the beacon of freedom across the world is critical. The, the crisis at the border should not be conflated with the annual number of refugees that we take in from around the world. And we actually have fully funded the, the 62,500 refugee cap that, that we need to restore it to, to be able to make sure that countries where there is, are, are torn by violence, are able to have their refugees come to this country you know, with a, a lifted cap from 15,000 to 62,500. We have the resources to do that, that's already funded. And it's also, a, a, what, what I've heard though, Michael, is that um, some of the resources for the refugee program are being used at the border. And as a, an appropriator, if the administration needs more resources, all they need to do is let us know because we need to make sure that we can provide resources to, to manage both, both immigration situations. 
Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz, always great to have you here. Thanks for the wide-ranging conversation. More to come, and <laughs> right. uh, take care. Thank you. Thanks so much, Congresswoman. You're welcome. Coming up next, the view from the viral disease expert putting the Johnson & Johnson vaccine suspension into context. Stay tuned. We are hoping to connect with FIU epidemiologist Eileen Marty in just a few minutes by way of Skype, which is uh, technology getting in our way at the moment. So we're going to move move along for just a moment. And we're going to move along to the state legislature where, you know, watching the legislature is sort of like watching, <laughs> I think, a NBA game. Almost everything happens in the final two minutes. All right, so tomorrow begins the final two weeks of session. So we have some South Florida lawmakers here to talk about really some of the most controversial bills in play, and they are hundreds of those, but we'll focus on just a few. Senator Perry Thurston, Democrat from Fort Lauderdale, uh, part of party leadership, and also along with Senator Thurston, we have Representative Tom Fabrizio, who is a Republican from Miramar, elected last November. It is so good to have both of you with us today. Gentlemen, Thanks. welcome. Glad you're here. Good Dana morning. Is, good to be here. And Tom Fabrizio, let me date myself and say your father and I worked together at the Miami Herald. He was a, he a terrific journalist, good writer, and it's nice to uh, meet you, even virtually. Michael, thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh, Senator Thurston, if I may, let's begin with uh, House Bill 1, which is now on the governor's desk. In the debate in the Senate on Friday, you were one of the leading voices against passage of this bill, which really stiffens, cracks down on protesters, makes uh, third degree felonies out of things which had been misdemeanors. Uh, if you could speak to Governor DeSantis right now, and in a sense you are, what would you tell him? What are your reasons for him not to sign this bill, which it looks like he's going to do? Well, well, I think the time to speak to uh, Governor DeSantis has almost passed us by, Michael. It's clear that this is a result of the governor heeding the then President Trump's call to ask all the governors and, and, and really attacking the governors, calling them weak saying they are fools when they were looking at the Black Lives Matter movement marches across the nation and really across the world. He called upon the governors to do this. And clearly, Governor DeSantis uh, heard the dog whistle and, more, and was more than ready to implement this unnecessary, uh, unconstitutional legislation, which we really don't need. There's no need for this. But uh, we're past that point. I think it's time for the business community to weigh in to see if this is what uh, they would like to see happening in a state where they're at. And I think you see some of that coming out of Georgia. You're going to see more of it coming from Florida because there are going to be demands for them to get off the sideline and take take a position regardless of what that position is. You know, Senator, yeah. I actually was on a conference call with a number of representatives from civil rights groups calling for exactly that from the business community and specifically seven Florida companies. I don't know if they've heard anything, but we specifically called and have heard crickets on that account. But I want to bring Representative Fabricio into the conversation. Welcome, your first time with us. I hope it's the first <laughs> of many. Um, you know, this, this protest bill, this anti-riot bill, is such a party line bill. And I wonder if Republicans in the House and Senate understand why particularly black Americans are seeing this along as a as a racist bill. You know, protest is a distinctly American vehicle for civil rights progress. So would you speak, you know, I don't expect you to speak on behalf of all Republicans, but but yourself, do you do you see that perspective? Sure, sure, Glenna. Thank you so much. I, I I, I hear what's being said on the other side, and it's unfortunate that it's be become so politically charged. This is really a bill about rioting, about violent protests. It's not about it's not about peaceful protests, which this doesn't invalidate or or quash in any which way. It's not a, the, the First Amendment issue of being able to protest is absolutely protected. This is a bill about rioting, about destructing uh, destruction of property, about uh, harming people. Uh, that's what this is about, and um, I believe. That, that that issue is being spoken to in this bill. 
Uh, Representative Fabrizio, it's sort of after the fact, but I need to say there are a couple of provisions of this bill. Clearly, I am not an attorney. Perry Thurston is. But, you know, there, there are, a, there's one provision here that I find very troublesome, which is it really provides a strength, stand your ground defense for a driver who finds himself herself caught up on a road which is shut down by demonstrators. It essentially gives them a free pass to drive through those demonstrators, uh, hurting them, even killing them, and present a defense, a defense which says, well, I, I, was, uh, uh, I was frightened, and it provides a justification, legal justification. Now, do you think that that is a acceptable provision? I, if, if I understand what you're asking, I think you're referring to the affirmative defense section. Yes, of the I am. Bill. Yes. Um, and that's a that's a that's a, pro, a provision in the bill. Of, as you know, in civil litigation, when a civil lawsuit is filed against uh, an individual or an entity for either negligent or intentional harm, um, uh, the, uh, in response, as a, in, in the answer, they can uh, an affirmative defense can be filed, and this creates an affirmative defense for a riot situation. Um, so, um, as far as um, I, I don't believe it. And I'm not sure if you, you, you couched it in these terms, but I don't believe this is a situation where there's a free pass for driving over people in any which way. I believe this is a situation where somebody can assert an affirmative defense that would be weighed by the court, um, and they would be able to present evidence in support of that affirmative defense, uh, like the plaintiff would be able to assert uh, in, um, in bringing forth their cause of action. Do you, along those lines, do you see any uh, issue with Florida's stand your ground law otherwise as it stands right now? Um, I, I don't. Um, that's not necessarily part of this bill uh, directly, I don't believe. It, it is not. It is not. No. no. It, Senator it, Thurston, do you want to yes. yes. address Glenn, that specific? Glenn, Glenn, Glenn I do. I do. Like stand your ground, you know, when stand your ground was implemented, we had always had a self-defense statute called justifiable use of force. And that made stand your ground unnecessary. Stand your ground was an invitation to do violence. This provision in this bill, giving civil uh, protection for individuals if they commit these types of acts is an invitation. It's almost like saying you can do this. It's like if you're in, if there's a right or if there's Better yet, if there's protest and there are people in the road, you have a free reign to just run through them and you're going to be protected. This bill is a horrific uh, reflection on Florida. I can't believe that the Senate even took this bill up. But it, when you look at uh, Florida's history in terms of the things that we've done here in Florida, this bill is totally unnecessary and we should really think back to, we should really hearken on do we need this? Yeah. Well, it, it appears that Governor DeSantis, who asked for the bill, was its chief advocate, probably is going to sign it. Let's move on, if we can, to another really hot bill in the legislature, and that is the so-called election reform bill. And Representative Fabricio, uh, frankly, this kind of looks like a solution in search of a problem in many ways. I think you would agree. Uh, you were elected last November in an election that was just about picture perfect. So why is are these provisions uh, in this bill, which is still being worked on, uh, why is this election reform bill needed? Thank you, Michael. Uh, this bill actually hasn't come in front of any of the committees that I sit in front of. It's, uh, I think it's going in front of state affairs uh, soon. Um, but uh, it tries to do several things that I think are positive. Uh, it, it does try to increase uh, transparency, and I, I imagine that you'd agree that transparency is a good thing. Um, and uh, it, it just wants to make sure that that the people who are voting are the actual voters. Um, there is this uh, the, the four-year signature limitation. I think um, you know it's going to create a little bit more work, uh, but we want to make sure that these issues with the signatures are good. I'll tell you this for a fact: uh, I stood at polls. Uh, the primary election this last year and the general election during early voting and on election day. And there were people who had issues with and, and actually through the uh, vote by mail uh, process, folks that had issues with their signatures, uh, having very old signatures on file. So updating the signatures, I think, would not be a bad thing. 
Uh, the question has to do with n maybe necessarily the frequency of it, but uh, updating the signatures I don't think is a bad thing. I don't think transparency is a bad thing. You know, I think uh, there's someone, one of the reporters from the Tampa Bay Times actually compared the governor's signatures <laughs> from the past couple of uh, elections and found that they were quite different. Senator Thurston, this SB yes. 90 is the bill number in the Senate. And it's, uh, to, to Michael's point, it's, it's being like the chefs are cooking it. And right now it looks like the drop boxes might be back. And that was a huge bone of contention because those drop boxes uh, last November proved to be really great for a lot of people. Where, where does that stand now? Well, well, everything about this bill is problematic. And the reason it's problematic is because it's uh, the legislative version of voter suppression. And the reason we know that is because, just like you said, uh, the election that was just he held was deemed perfect, that it, we, it was held up as the gold standard. But you see, the individuals who are behind me on the wall, the reason they are protesters and demonstrators is because they were trying to secure the right to vote. So when you have a sordid history like Florida that goes back to denying people the right to vote, for ages, whether it be Jim Crow laws, whether it be poll taxes, this is just a continuation. Of course, it doesn't say we want to stop people from voting, but if you look at the particulars, including the drop box Leonard, that you talked about, there was no problem with that. But why is it in the bill? Why was it in the bill? Why does it continue to be brought up, not only here, but in Georgia and then across the other 37 states who are doing this? This is a national policy to say, how do we stop people from voting? One of the things we should be doing is encouraging more people to vote. But the drop boxes were great. People who were concerned about the pandemic, people who just was concerned about the mail delivery system. All of that was there. The vote by mail worked perfectly. We'll recall that we had Pete Antonacci in Broward County this last cycle, and it went quite well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, Antonacci is no longer the broad supervisor of elections. We hope and expect that things will go well, but we have had a sordid history in Broward County with elections. Well, the previous election supervisor did have problems and the one before her. So we, we understand what the history has been. All right, everybody stick uh, where you are. Uh, we're going to take a brief break, break and back uh, with more with these legislators in just a minute. We are back taking the temperature of Tallahassee with Senator Perry Thurston, Democrat from Fort Lauderdale, and State Rep Tom Fabricio from Miramar, Republican. In the short time we have together, gentlemen, um, with all of these really controversial bills being in the headlines, we're really not talking about auto insurance. That affects everybody watching today. Uh, Senator Thurston, are, are you going to eliminate no fault and mandate that everybody have personal injury coverage, and, and what are the ramifications of that to everyone listening? Well, I, I think that clearly we have uh, an issue with auto insurance, and we need, for all of the drivers who are out there on our street, we want them to be covered. There's been a bill that's been brewing in the Senate for the entirety of the session. We did get an opportunity to address that bill, and we've passed it, and there will be a uh, Right now, there's mandatory BI on the bill. And I think that it's going to be a lot more movement on this bill before the final version. I expect it to bounce back, to the, go to the House and bounce back, and we probably will make some more changes. But I think that this is probably the best opportunity in years, and uh, it may lead to the elimination of PI. Yeah, a representative for BCO. Uh, Fabricio, you, you are a member of the House Commerce Committee. This is really in your wheelhouse. What, what is the, how are you going to improve the auto insurance situation in the state by eliminating no fault? Well, we've really looked at this issue in several different ways. Um, and one view that I've taken on from very early on was perhaps continuing to work to fix uh, the PIP, the no fault system. Um, but uh, that being, uh, you know, being that we've, uh, it seems that we're moving beyond that. Uh, the issue is that we want to make sure that our constituents and throughout the state, and in particular with folks in Hialeah and Miami Lakes, and throughout and in Miramar, that we want to make sure that their auto premiums are in line. We, these, uh, the, like Senator Thurston said, we've been having uh, quite a bit of 
quite a bit of trouble statewide with auto insurance, but we want to make sure that premiums are in line and people are getting the uh, appropriate coverages that they're going to need. Representative Fabrizio, you, you sponsored a bill in the House that I'm just going to put my own headline on it, having read it. It, it kind of protects the fuel industry um, and possibly at the expense of some green energy progress. Am I reading that right? What is that? So I'll tell you, that's uh, House Bill 839. Um, that's uh, an ener a fuel, a transportation fuel energy preemption. And the reason why we filed this bill is because of a couple of things. Uh, there has been an ordinance filed out in uh, Penaluma, California, and then uh, an actual an ordinance was filed out in Tampa. Uh, that spoke towards getting, uh, not allowing transactions of non-renewable energy sources by 2030. Um, while I believe those are laudable and very important initiatives, and we certainly want to go to renewable energy sources uh, as quickly as possible, I don't think we're quite there yet. And to say that we're not going to be able to have gas stations in a municipality or in a county would be would cause a statewide regional issue. Um, as, uh, if, if you limit uh, for example, in Tampa, if you if you don't allow uh, petroleum to be imported through the through the port of Tampa, that could cause a, a massive problem with uh, with transportation in Central Florida. Same thing for Miami-Dade County. Yeah. I don't expect these issues to occur. I've spoken to many of the mayors in my in my district, and they say that they would not uh, support an ordinance that would, by de facto, yeah. eliminate all transportation energy. Uh, but this is something that is a potential issue. It's something that's being discussed, uh, and it's something that we need to make sure it doesn't happen. Yeah. So what the bill does is, because it's very important that, that we clarify and we just move beyond the headline here. What the bill does, it, okay. it says that municipality... Representative, I'm going to, forgive me, I'm going to have to interrupt you here. And Senator Thurston, thank you very much for being with us. We really appreciate it. We'll follow what goes on in Tallahassee. And now we want to sort of reintroduce the guest who we had a Zoom issue problem, but we have made contact with Dr. Eileen Marty, the FIU epidemiologist. There she is, Dr. Marty. Good afternoon. Great to see you. Great to see you, Michael. And thank Glad you for it. and thank you for rocking and rolling with us as we <laughs> try to navigate our technology in the time of COVID. So, Dr. Marty, earlier in the program, we were talking about how we've had this momentum in vaccinations here in South Florida, the, the state. And now with Johnson & Johnson's suspension, uh, next week the state of Florida is getting half of the doses that it got about two weeks ago. Let's start out by just um, putting put this into context, the suspension and what we're going to face and, and how that impacts that momentum. Oh my goodness, you just gave me 12 questions in one. Okay, you have two <laughs> minutes, go. <laughs> Let, let's start. Let's start with why the suspension. The reason for the suspension is the over 345 cases of this unusual immunologic reaction in, in Europe and the UK, and the six cases here in the US. All of them associated with the use of a replication incompetent adenovirus, and there are different adenoviruses in the AstraZeneca vaccine compared to the J and J, but they're both adenoviruses, and we've known since 1999 in animal studies that adenoviruses can, in very rare instances, cause these problems. There have been studies from 1999, 2002, 2005, 2007 that have demonstrated these types of rare events. And what's Well, we, we apologize, but the uh, Zoom link to Dr. Marty, boy, it is really acting up. So now you see, you see firsthand what we have been dealing with in our ears for the last hour. Uh, so what we want to do is take a quick break. Stay tuned. There is more to come. Welcome back. You know, tourist-driven Key West gets crowded when cruise ships come in, but that hasn't happened since the COVID cruise suspension last year. And in November, Key West voters passed limits to keep it that way. They passed three ordinances that regulate the size of the ships and the number of passengers allowed per day that descend on the city. And now state lawmakers are pushing a bill that would overturn the decision by Key West voters. Key West Mayor Terry Johnston is here with us. She is against overturning the will of those people. Mayor, 
Great to have you with us, and thank you for having internet that works. <laughs> <laughs> Mayor Johnston, welcome. And thank you for the invitation. We, we are so glad to see you. All right, kind of take us through the history of this. The cruise ships came in, uh, disgorged thousands up to, I guess, 10,000 or so passengers could come in on a given day. What you and your fellow Key Westers, you know, passed a referendum that said, no, we want to limit the number of ships, the number of passengers, and then what happened? I mean, you passed ordinances to that effect. Well, we did. In November, we had a record number of voters turn out, uh, Michael, and they voted on the three referendum. Uh, one was to give preferential treatment to the cruise lines with the most and the best environmental records and best health records, and also to limit the number of of people who disembark into our two by four island on a daily basis. Uh, basically, uh, the referendum passed anywhere from uh, high 70s to low 81%. And then uh, it was overturned and preempted when it got to the state level, which is of great concern to not only the municipality of, of the city of Key West, but also to every municipality across the state of Florida. So, so the bill that's just so if people aren't following this, so I, 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 the bill that's going through the legislature right now, House bill, it's 267, Senate bill, it's 426. It is preempting local governments, uh, municipalities, counties, uh, counties from setting rules that would govern the ports and the cruise industry. But it's so narrowly written that the only port that it's mm -hmm. affected is the port of Key West. So obviously it is done to overturn this particular vote, but uh, because we tried very hard to get someone who's supporting this who would not or could not be with us today, uh, their argument is, listen, this is a, an enormous business. You can't thwart this kind of business that doesn't really do any harm in the big picture. What do you say to that? Well, uh, first of all, uh, you know, clearly we disagree with with that statement. Uh, we disembark over 900,000 passengers onto our two by four island every year. Um, we have a, a great deal of information on the environmental uh, uh, damage that is done when these massive cruise ships come into one of the most narrow channels that, that they visit. Uh, as you know, we're home for the, the third barrier reef in the world. We're a, a fragile ecosystem, and uh, we believe that, that the cruise ships do do damage, clearly. Uh, to us, this is not only an environmental issue, but it is a preemption of home rule. And there isn't anybody that's more impacted or understands the impact of cruise ships than the residents of Key West, which is what concerns us greatly, that, that their opinions are, are basically being overturned by legislators in North Florida that, that basically, uh, I believe, do not understand the, the long-term environmental impacts and the impact of the quality of life uh, for the residents of Key West. Yeah, Mayor Johnston, uh, we know that last week a group of about 20 Key Westers went up to uh, Tallahassee to make the case that in fact, respect our sovereignty, respect the will of the people. Uh, what did the lawmakers tell the people from Key, the citizens of Key West who went up there? Well, basically we, we got had an opportunity to present to the Senate Rules Committee. Uh, this item was being heard, so we did. We brought uh, 19 individuals from Key West and these are the heart and soul of Key West. They were charter boat fishermen, uh, they were flats guides, uh, guest house um, uh, owners, artists. Uh, we had a real cross section. And these people, Michael, got up at three o'clock in the morning to uh, board a plane in Marathon that they had, had, had funded through donations. We got up to Tallahassee and we were able to be heard, uh, but unfortunately, uh, many of the presentations were cut short. Uh, most of the 19 people who wanted to convey to the, the rules committee what an impact that cruise ships have on the city of Key West were actually cut short. In fact, most of the 19 people got less than 30 seconds in order to speak to mm. the legislators. So I think, I think we got a sense of what's happening in Key West. If you have never been here during a three cruise ship disembarkation day, uh, but I, I certainly would have appreciated 
had they given the 19 people, uh, 19 residents Key West more time in order to, to mm -hmm. just convey how cruise ships impact them personally. Well, I, can you, why didn't they get more time? I mean, there is, there are public speakers, there is time for public yeah. speaking and all the committee meetings explain what, what happened. Well, actually, actually, the chair cut them short. And I know that there were a lot of speakers on items. Uh, hun highly controversial items will draw a lot of speakers. You know, I know in local government, we have a three minute uh, rule and everybody gets their three minutes, uh, no matter how many times we've heard the same comments, uh, no matter what. But but, you know, that's our jobs as legislatures is, first of all, to listen uh, and listen to the people that actually put us in office. So, yeah, you know, we we do understand, Senator uh, Mayor, that this is one of the weirdest legislative sessions in Florida <laughs> history. I mean, anybody who wants to testify before a Senate or House committee has to go to a civic building nearby. You are not in the building. Nobody's in the building except the lawmakers themselves and some staff members. Uh, what about, I understand that your group also went out to the governor's mansion. Was there any reaction from Governor DeSantis? Uh, we haven't gotten any response from Governor DeSantis, but we certainly hope to. Uh, we know that Governor DeSantis is an environmental champion, and there can't be any more uh, important environmental issue than, than you know, retaining our, 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 our very, very sensitive ecosystem in the city of Key West. You know, we're a two by four island. We love tourists. We welcome tourists. But we also would like to do that in a level of moderation that protects our environment and still keeps us open in a vibrant, uh, vibrant tourism uh, economy. So we'd like to do both. And we believe that that's what we're asking for in these three referendums. We're asking for moderation. And uh, we, we hope that the governor will take note and will certainly um, you know, abide by his environmental stances and protect the community of Key West. So, Mayor, in the minute we have left, is there a, a plan for a plan B? Because there's really nothing in the bill that prevents Key West or a municipality from, from doing other managing activities at the port. Um, could you say that again, Glenn? I'm sorry, I'm getting a little feedback here, as, is there, as you would expect from today. We, yeah, we have like a minute left, so just to, to telegraph that for you. Um, there, I was wondering if you had a, a plan B in case this bill does become law, because there's really nothing in the bill that prevents Key West from, from managing its port, even if it passes. So what's, the, what's yeah. plan B? Is there one? Well, I think probably if this bill passes, um, there will be cruise ship activity. We have, we have three uh, piers here in Key West. We have Mallory Square Pier, which is the smallest, and then we have uh, the Outer Mall, which is managed by the Navy, and then we have Pier B, which is managed by the Walsh family from uh, Margaritaville. And we, we believe that if the bill passes, that there will be cruise ship activity at one of the three piers, which is Pier B which in itself uh, will limit the number of, of disembarkations Mayor, Mayor that we Terry have Johnson, in the city of Key West. Mayor Terry Johnson, I beg your pardon. We are out of time. Thank you for joining us. Good luck with this venture. Love Key Thank West. You. Used to have a home there. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Used to have a home everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Thank you Mayor. for the opportunity. Thank Thanks you. so much. And we thank you for being here with us as we do every Sunday. Grateful for the hour we spend together. And remember, we are always online 24-7 at local10.com. And remember, as always, stay informed, get involved. Have a great Sunday.